What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Dolphins in Depth podcast. I'm Daniel Yafusi. Thanks so much for tuning in. And it was another busy week for the team in South Florida. We had a big new deal. We had a big trade. We have the start of OTAs for Mike McDaniel and the squad on Monday. We're actually going to get to talk to a few players on Wednesday. So definitely be tuned on MiamiHerald.com for the latest updates to how the team is faring as they get to work uh, for preparations for the start of the new season. Man, it feels like the 2021 season ended yesterday last week uh, but the Dolphins are back at it uh, starting their offseason workout program two is in the building Jalen Waddle is in the building and the Dolphins are getting right uh, back at it to try to build off of a really strong offseason uh, but I want to start with the biggest news of the past week for the Dolphins and that is the new five-year deal for star cornerback Xavier Howard yes five years an extra two years to that deal with 50 uh, $50 million in new money, which uh, if you average those two years would be the most of any quarterback in NFL history. Um, the Dolphins, Xavier Howard, his agent, David Cantor, finally get that deal under wraps. It's a deal that David Cantor said was in the works for 15 months. You know, you have to go back to uh, last August around that time, last July, when uh, Xavier Howard had some frustration with his deal. Um, he sat out a couple practices. He requested a trade. Um, the Dolphins came to the negotiating table. They were able to work out a short-term compromise where they moved some uh, guarantees up and uh, gave him a little bit more money and incentives. But now they reach another agreement on a new five-year deal, $90 million in total. Um, but, you know, this is a, a deal that we've all been kind of keeping our eyes on as the Dolphins have made a lot of moves, given out a lot of money. Uh, everyone was wondering, when is Xavier Howard going to get his money? And he finally did. Um, I really see this as a win-win for both sides. Obviously, you want to keep your best player on the team in the fold. Um, you know, the, the Dolphins... As Chris Greer said before, they made a, a promise to Xavier Howard to revisit this deal and find some type of agreement where Xavier Howard can be paid um, and his annual salary can be more in the, you know, the top of the cornerback and with the top cornerbacks in the league. And he gets that for him. Um, again, it's an increase in pay. He gets more guarantees. It's a new five-year deal through the 2026 season now. Um, so he's he's here for the, for the, for the long haul right now. Um, he's the longest tenured player after the trade of Devontae Parker, which we're going to talk about um, later on. Um, but again, the Dolphins keep their best player. They keep one of their veteran leaders. Um, they get cap relief for 2022. I think that, that was a, a big thing that um, kind of was going under the radar, the fact that um, Xavier Howard had a cap hit of $16 million originally. Um, but by restructuring this contract, that number goes all the way down to $8 million. It balloons up uh, in 2023 to around $20 million, million or so. Um, but again, the Dolphins and Chris Greer and that front office have shown that um, they have no problem restructuring deals, moving money around um, to remain flexible under the cap and uh, be able to make moves. So again, in the short term, long term, um, it, it's great for both sides, and it really does avoid any distractions heading into 2022. I mean, this was kind of a cloud over uh, the first couple of weeks uh, of training camp last year. Um, and I asked Chris Greer about this uh, at the owners meeting last week. I said, hey, is there any update um, with those contract negotiations? You know, I'm sure you probably don't want to uh, have to deal with that again this summer. And he said, hey, we don't we're not going to you know, negotiate in the press, but we have talked. Um, and lo and behold, four days later. Uh, David Cantor makes that announcement on April Fool's. I thought it was a thought it may have been an April Fool's joke, but I was like, ain't, ain't no way he's he's joking about a new deal like that. Um, but they but they get get that deal um, put together um, on Friday, uh, last Friday. Um, and, you know, they keep Xavier Howard in the fold. And this is really, to me, um, kind of the last big domino. Obviously, you know, the Dolphins could make some moves um, in the weeks to, to come and after the, um, the NFL uh, draft at the end of the month. Um, but in terms of kind of what was on the checklist coming into this offseason, this is really the, the last domino. Um, you know, dating back to the combine, Chris Greer said that they were going to revisit this contract. We all assumed that they were going to revisit this contract. And it's the, the latest move to kind of keep this defense intact. So when you look at it um, on paper, the Dolphins are set to return every single player that ended the season as a starter um, from top to bottom, defensive line linebacker, secondary, they're all bringing them back. And it was clear, you know, even from the moment that um, the team went with Mike McDaniel and um, the coaching staff changes that they made, keeping Josh Boyer in line um, in, in the forward as, as defensive coordinator, it was clear that they really wanted to run it back with this defense. That was one of the uh, league's best 
in the second half of the season, kind of spearheading that eight and one uh, finish. They re-signed Emmanuel Agba. They re-signed all of their rotational linebackers, whether that's Duke Riley, Sam Egwavon, um, Landon Roberts, Bre uh, Brennan Scott. I mean, they brought them all back. They even um, restructured Byron Jones's contract to kind of re retain some cap flexibility, even though there were some rumors that he might be traded. So again, um, they're run, they're running it back in the very literal sense of the word. I think that's going to be the real test. I know a lot of eyes are on the offense and what changes Mike McDaniel is going to make um, with this new this new zone running scheme and this new West Coast offense and whatnot. But I, I'm really curious to see um, what drop off, if at all, there is with this defense. We all know that the past couple of years, this has been a defense that's been led by Brian Flores. That's former coach Brian Flores. Um, although Josh Boyer spent the past couple of years as the defensive coordinator. And I think there are, I've been saying it, there are very fair questions as to what role Josh Boyer had um, in the second half of the season operating this defense. So the pressure, I would say, is on him. I know there's a lot of talk about the pressure on Tua, there's pressure on this offensive line. I think there's real pressure on Josh Boyer to make sure that there isn't a drop-off. He said that um, they are going to retain some kind of core of what they did under Flores just because um, those two overlap for so long in New England and then in Miami that there's just naturally going to be some overlap but um, as a former secondary coach as a former um, defensive backs coach he says he thinks he sees things from uh, from the bottom or the top down you know looking at um, kind of evaluating this defense from the secondary and then um, letting everything um, come together and I, I found that really interesting I'm not sure exactly what that means um, does that mean we see more formations with more defensive backs does he ask more of his defensive backs in 2022. I'm not really sure, but I think that those are one of the things that I'm really going to keep my eye out for when we do eventually get to watch some of these practices um, in the offseason workout programs, and then later on in training camp. What exactly does Josh Boyer do to put his imprint on this defense? Because again, this was a defense that was statistically one of the league's worst during the first half of the season. Something clicked. Part of it is that they did play a, a lighter schedule in the second half of the season to, to, to put it nicely. But again, you have to play the guys that are in front of you. And they were one of the league's best units in the second half of the season. So the question for Josh Boyer is going to be, what can you do to sustain or even elevate that unit? Um, and I and again, I think that with Xavier Howard back in the fold, Byron Jones, um, and then you have a lot of young guys on, the, on that unit that are entering their second, third, fourth years, um, whether that's Javon Holland, Jalen Phillips, or Christian Wilkins. Um, the hope is that those guys continue to make that improvement with this coaching staff that they've shown um, they have a really nice um, you know, rapport and chemistry with. Um, if they can stay healthy, if the young guys can, you know, make that ascension and get better. Um, and I think the health is really going to be important because again, we saw how um, the first half of the season was kind of derailed when Byron Jones and Xavier Howard were, were out of uh, the lineup because of some nagging injuries. I mean, this unit is really built through the secondary. I mean, they, they can blitz, they can do a lot of their exotic um, pressures and fronts because they can rely on those guys in the back with Howard um, Jones. And now we're starting to see Javon Holland really come into his own as a rookie. And, you know, you hope that he can take that, uh, that Pro Bowl step in year two. They can do so much because that secondary is locked down. So I think health is going to be a big part of it. Um, Byron Jones, he had an Achilles injury um, that he had surgery for. Looks like he's going to be ready to go for the starting training camp. Um, but if you have all those guys ready and locked to go, I mean, it's one of the best secondaries in the league. Um, it's one of the best defenses in the league. And the hope is that there really isn't a drop off. So it could be a really special unit. Um, and the Dolphins have shown that by literally keeping everyone. I mean, of their major contributors and major rotational players, um, they've kept just about everybody. So we're going to see whether that uh, works in their favor or not. You know, a lot of times you don't want to stay stagnant. You want to at least look for some upgrades. And I thought that um, the decision not to necessarily upgrade the inside linebacker position next to Jerome Baker, I thought that was an interesting one. Um, but I understand Chris Greer's assessment when he spoke about it at the owners meeting that, um, you know, he liked what each of the individual players brought, whether that was Duke Riley contributing on special teams and then some sub packages, um, the leadership role that Atlanta Roberts brought. I, I did understand that. Um, but again, it was clear from the beginning of this uh, of this offseason that they wanted to keep this defense together. And Xavier Howard was the latest uh, move to show that they really wanted to keep that core intact. So we'll see what happens with, with that defense and whether they can sustain the level of play that we've seen over the past couple of years.
Uh, we're going to take a short break, uh, but when we come back on the other side of things, we're going to talk about the other big move of the past week that was the Dolphins trading away wide receiver Devontae Parker and to an in-division rival. I know some fans are, are a little pressed about that. We're going to talk about that and uh, what that means for both sides going forward. So stay locked with us. What's going on, everybody? Still here talking the big Dolphins moves of the past week on the Dolphins in Depth podcast. And as we said before, the Dolphins reached an agreement with cornerback Xavier Howard on a new five year deal that keeps him with the team through 2026, adds two new years to that contract with $50 million in new money. Uh, and it looked like that was going to be the big, uh, the sole big Dolphins news of the day. Uh, but the Dolphins weren't done making moves. They've shown that they're, they're still on the phones talking to teams and uh, making moves all offseason. And they followed it up a day later by trading wide receiver Devontae Parker to the New England Patriots. Now, the full um, trade details that became official um, on, on Tuesday afternoon, the Dolphins officially announcing that and kind of saying their farewell, goodbye to Devontae Parker. Um, they send Parker and the 2022 fifth round pick um, to New England Patriots, and they're going to recoup a third round pick in the 2023 draft. Um, so the Dolphins um, saying goodbye, cutting ties with the longest tenured player. Uh, Devontae Parker was picked 14th overall in the 2015 NFL draft out of Louisville. Um, he ended uh, his career, his Dolphins career, top 10 in receptions and receiving yards. Uh, he was one of, you know, the most productive receivers, um, uh, you know, in, in the league or one of the better receivers in the league when healthy. But obviously injuries were something that he just couldn't really shake only played one uh, full season in his seven-year career. Um, otherwise, he missed some games here and there. I know he missed about seven games last year with the shoulder and hamstring injury. Um, and you, you kind of saw the writing on the wall with the hire of Mike McDaniel and the subsequent moves, um, signing Cedric Wilson, trading for Tyree Kill. You have Jalen Waddle. By all accounts and the moves have shown um, that this is a new offense that is gonna really prioritize um, quick receivers who can separate, who can get the ball in their hands and then work after the catch. Um, and, and it just seemed like Devontae Parker was the odd man out um, between those three receivers. I mean, at best, it seemed like he was going to be the team's number three or number four receiver. We know Devontae Parker has a really, really strong skill set. He can make those 50-50 jump ball contested catches down the field. Um, but it seems like that's not something that's really going to be prioritized in this offense. And when you look at it, um, paying a number three or number four receiver, it just never, I mean, paying that that type of receiver, $6 million, having him count $8 million on the cap, it just didn't really seem like something that was going to be feasible. Um, I did ask Chris Greer at the owners meetings last week um, whether he expected Devontae Parker to be on the roster and whether he had received trade calls. And he said, I did expect him to be on the roster, but, um, you know, I've listened to calls on everybody and I've received calls regarding Parker. Um, I felt like, you know, once he kind of added that, that, but I've received phone calls and I'm willing to listen to anybody, I could kind of tell the writing was on the wall. And again, less than a week later, Monte Parker um, is headed to Foxborough. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a unique trade because it is an in-division rival. Um, I know some Dolphins fans were, were kind of upset about the move and you know whether it might it may come back to bite um the the dolphins um you know there's this saying that you know why help out your enemy why help out uh, an division rival and have to play him two years um two times a year where he's rejuvenated he's out for revenge and whatnot i get it i i really do and i know a lot of fans point to um the last time well not the last time it happened because isaiah ford was traded to the to the patriots from the dolphins um but a notable in division trade, um, you know, a couple of years back with Dolphins sending Wes Welker to New England Patriots. Um, I know a lot of Dolphins fans are still scarred about the way he's carved up the team over the years, um, but I really don't see that in, in the same light. I mean, um, again, Devontae Parker is uh, a guy who's 29 years old. Um, you know, he, he had a really good run in Miami. Injuries just kind of got the best of him more years than not. Um, and, you know, if I think he's going to be a good fit in in uh, New England because that's a team that is kind of lacking in talent at the wide receiver position. Um, it seems like they kind of struck out on getting some of these bigger profile names. Um, so they get a guy in Devontae Parker who's only going to be paid $6 million. That is a steal for number one wide receiver. When you look at the going rate for receivers now, which is um, upwards of $20 million, um, and, you know, Devontae Parker gets an opportunity to be a number one receiver um, and he gets to stay in the division where he knows all the teams 
Um, you know, the preparation isn't going to be much different. You're playing the, you're playing or um, the same two, three teams um, each year, a couple times a year. Um, so I think it's a good fit for him and um, we'll see what happens there. I mean, again, I, I look at the situation as like five years from now, are we going to say that um, this is a deal that completely bit the Dolphins and, 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 you know, burned them and they would have been better off keeping Devontae Parker? I really don't. I mean, Devontae Parker would have been probably the best number three, definitely the best number four wide receiver in the NFL. Um, but again, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of layers to this. I mean, like Chris Greer said, the team does like having good players. I mean, the depth was great. And I think that the depth is still good now, even with Parker in my uh, in New England. Um, but you got to look at big picture. I mean, is this really what's best for the team's cap situation, not only this year, but next year? Because he did have two years remaining on that four-year extension he signed a couple years back. Um, so now the Dolphins get to save $3 million this year. They get to save even more next year and they recoup a third round pick. Um, when you look at the work the Dolphins have done to not only man manipulate the cap, but acquire draft capital, I know that they've pretty much um, gotten rid of all their picks in 2022. They only have four left, but you look at next year and this is a team that is going to be stocked and ready to make moves. Um, you know, I, I believe that they have four or five picks in the next three round uh, in the first three rounds of 2023. Um, they have two first rounders. They were able to keep their first rounder despite the Tyree kill trade, which I thought was probably the most shrewd and best move of the off season so far. Um, and the Dolphins are going to have money next year. I mean, um, they I, I think that the most impressive thing about this offseason has been that the Dolphins have been able to upgrade um, major positions of need and maintain cap flexibility and also draft capital. Again, they don't have it this year, um, which you'll take. I mean, you'll, I, I'm sure all Dolphins fans will give up all those picks for Tyree Kill in a heartbeat. They would do it 10 times out of 10. Um, so they don't have the draft capital this year. But they have the draft capital next year if they do need to make moves. Um, obviously, it's a big quarterback draft. Um, I'm not going to get ahead of myself, um, although, you know, this is a big year for Tua. Um, but they've kind of kept the flex, kept flexibility where, um, you know, they've surrounded Tua with, with players, but they've also kind of provided themselves a safety net where if they do have to make any drastic moves, they have the ammo, ammo to do that. And they even, I mean, they still have ammo to, to make moves um, this year with their, their cap space. Um, they entered this week with about $11 million dollars in cap space according to the NFL's uh, salary cap report, but that doesn't account for the roughly $8 million they're saving by restructuring Xavier Howard's contract. That goes from a $6 million cap hit to an $8 million cap hit, and as well as the $3 million that they're saving by trading away Devontae Parker. So you have $20 million in cap space remaining for this year. Um, you have only a few major needs left. I mean, if you look at the needs that they haven't filled, I mean, um, Chris Greer said that they're going to add a center uh, with competition to, uh, for Michael Dieter. Um, they can potentially use a depth peaks at right tackle because um, you're just not completely certain about those young guys, whether that's Austin Jackson or Liam Eichenberg. Um, they obviously could use a punter. And I know everyone's talking about San Diego State's Matt Areza. If I'm the Dolphins, I might jump the gun and just use the third round pick to wrap him up and, uh, and take care of that. Um, so obviously punters still in need inside linebacker, um, potentially adding another young depth piece because all the guys they re-signed are on one, one year deals. Um, and then defensive line, I know that they re-signed Emmanuel Agba, um, but Zach Sealer is, um, you know, he's going to be a free agent in, in two years. Um, Adam Butler is going to be a free agent after the 2022 season. I think it'd be good to kind of add some young blood um, to that to that defensive line because you can never have too many pass rushers, too many guys who can um, move along the defensive front. Um, but again, the Dolphins have remained remained uh, flexibility or retained flexibility despite all these major moves. I think that that's the most impressive thing about this uh, about this entire offseason. Um, I think that this Devontae Parker uh, trade is the latest uh, move where you know they're able to um, you know kind of clear clear the the um, the depth chart in terms of kind of getting a legitimate and a drawn out one two three. It's going to be Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, Cedric Wilson. Um, you get cap space, you get draft capital. Everyone's happy. Uh, you hope Devontae Parker um, does not come to burn you two times a year for the next three, four years. Um, but I think also think it's very telling that the Dolphins um, and Chris Greer were willing um, to trade Devontae Parker 
to a uh, to a division rival. Um, the Patriots may have been the only team that would have, you know, that were willing to give up what the Dolphins wanted. Um, but the fact that they weren't deterred by it being an in-division rival, I think that speaks to a lot about um, how they feel, um, not only about the draft capital they were recouping, but the potential for Don- Devontae Parker to be a thorn in their sides. Um, but again, that's uh, to be determined. We'll see if that happens. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see him in uh, some new colors after um, you know suiting up for the Dolphins over the past couple of years. All right, that brings us to the end of another edition of the Dolphins in Depth podcast. Uh, I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. As always, um, again, OCA started Monday. We're set to talk to a couple of players this week. Um, so definitely um, keep a uh, lookout for MiamiHero.com as we kind of give you an update on how the team is uh, doing as they begin their offseason workout program under new coach Mike McDaniel. Um, We'll be back here another uh, next week to recap another week of Dolphins football. Uh, we'll see what the team in South Florida has in store for us. But until then, you guys take care. See you.